So welcome everyone to DrupalCon and to uh, the first session of the Symphony Track. This uh, thing we just added the last few years at uh, DrupalCon that um, I'm rather fond of. Uh, my name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me during the session on Twitter, that's where you do so. I highly recommend it. <coughs> I am a senior architect with Palantir.net. We're a digital agency based in Chicago in the United States. Uh, we work mostly but not exclusively with Drupal. Uh, we also do some Symfony work, some Silex work. Uh, we're an end-to-end -end company, so design, content strategy, development, um, custom modules, site architecture, pretty much everything except hosting we do. For Drupal 8, I was also the web services initiative lead, um, which means I'm the one you can blame for the fact that we have a Symfony track with DrupalCon. Also the Drupal representative to the PHP Framework Interoperability Group. Who's heard of FIG? A couple, you know, decent number of people. So for those who don't have their hands up, uh, FIG is basically the United Nations of PHP with all the positive and ne negative implications that has. Uh, advisor to the Drupal Association, and I do implement PSR8 Huggable Interface. So, uh, as do most Drupal people. So let's talk about Symphony. That's kind of why we're here. Specifically, Symphony 2. Symphony 2 is a tier one PHP framework. By tier one, I mean it's one of the big boys. It's probably one of the, the I think in the latest stats, it's one of the top three uh, frameworks in PHP in terms of its usage and adoption. Uh, it's also the basis for a lot of other projects, including the number one, which is Laravel. It's a loosely coupled framework. It's not a, a fully decoupled system, but the way Symfony is built, it's a series of loosely coupled components that are then assembled into an application framework. But you can assemble those components together into different application frameworks, which is how you get things like Symfony Full Stack, Silex, Laravel, and Drupal 8. And that loose coupling is why Symfony 2 was really one of the kickstarters of the revolution in PHP and the PHP renaissance uh, of the last five or so years in the PHP 5.3 era. Uh, you know, Symfony was one of the early drivers of that and in fact was the incubator for Composer. Who's worked with Composer? Correct answer, thank you. <laughs> so Composer grew out of the Symfony community. Uh, they saw a need and unlike the rest of the PHP world at the time, decided let's not make this specific to us. And that helped change the face of PHP. So who are you? I don't know, who are you? He's Andrew, okay. <laughs> I'm Larry, good to meet you. Uh, I am going to assume that you know Drupal 7. You're a Drupal developer, you've worked with Drupal 7 before. You may or may not know some of Drupal 8. You may have worked, dabbled a little, you may have worked in issue queues, I'm not sure but you want to move down stack. And by down stack, I mean you want to get less UI in the way. You want to do more framework-driven work, more straight application work, less automation, more code. You want to be building pure applications, not just CMS type stuff. This, who, who falls into generally this category I just described? All right, I'm in the right room. Uh, quick show of hands, who has worked with Drupal 8 to some degree so far? Excellent. Who has no Drupal 8 experience whatsoever? All right. Uh, and who here is actually a Symphony person, not a Drupal person, who's just here to troll me? <laughs> Knew it. <laughs> All right. So the first question I often hear from Drupal developers looking at Drupal 8 is, so am I going to have to learn Symphony in order to understand Drupal 8? I hear this all the time, and the answer is a resounding no. If you're here to learn about Drupal 8 specifically, uh, there are plenty of other sessions to go to instead of this one. This session is about Symfony. Because as I said, Symfony is a decoupled system, it's a, a loosely coupled system. So the way Symfony is built, you have the Symfony component libraries, which are mostly decoupled, mostly standalone. Some of them have a few dependencies, but for the most part, these are standalone components that uh, you can use. And then there's various partnered libraries like the Twig templating system, Doctrine, uh, Monologue, various other projects that are not part of Symfony but get used by Symfony. And then uh, those get tied together by something called the Symfony Framework Bundle. Bundles we'll talk about are 
the symphony equivalents of modules, essentially. And this kind of glues everything together. It's roughly the equivalent of system module, but for symphony, it's not quite that ugly, though. And then symphony's add-ons called bundles uh, that you can attach and build whatever kind of application you want out of those. Some of the bigger ones are the CMF components, the content management framework. Drupal is actually using some of those too. And that together builds the Symfony full stack framework. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. In contrast, Drupal 8 uses some of the Symfony components, but about a third of them actually. It doesn't use the, the, even the majority. Uh, many of the same partnered libraries. But then it also has its own component libraries we've built its own Drupal core libraries that are just part of Drupal itself, then its extensions, uh, both the ones that are bundled with core uh, and add-ons, you can build distributions with that. So it, they are siblings. Drupal, excuse me, Drupal 8, Symfony, Silex, Laravel are all siblings or cousins, but they're not the same system. They are different to work with, and that's what we're talking about here. So who wants to learn how to develop for Symfony? Good, step one, go read the documentation. It's excellent, <coughs> really. The, the Symphony documentation team does a great job. Uh, and their, their documentation is really solid, especially for you know, the, the components as well. So I'm not gonna cover the things that are already covered there. Instead, what I wanna cover is, coming from a Drupal perspective, here are the gotchas. Here are the things that are going to trip you up, that are going to confuse you, that you should be aware of when you go to read the documentation, when you go to try and build a project, uh, you know, what, the, the things that you need to think about and be aware are different than we're used to in Drupal. So, first of all, who is the system for? Well, Drupal's primary audience is content strategists. It's not developers. It's people doing content modeling. It's people managing the site long term. It's people creating content through the site and curating content. That's Drupal's primary audience. Its focus in what it tries to enable is letting people build stuff on the web without having to write code. That is essentially Drupal's mission statement. Build cool stuff on the web without writing code. Symfony, by contrast, is aimed at professional PHP developers. It is aimed at people who are writing code for a living and like it that way. It's ideally suited for bespoke applications. That's custom, all right, what do you want? So let's just build it, let's go with it, rather than take one application and customize it a little bit for each client. Uh, it's, its mission statement is essentially make writing code on the web easier. Not avoid it, but make it easier to do. Take care of the boring parts so you can focus on the interesting parts for your application. And that distinction carries through pretty much the entire system. That's the, the biggest shift coming from a Drupal world. So, both systems are highly configurable, but the biggest difference in Drupal, we have this big complex user interface, lots of forms, lots of, con of configuration options, lots of you know, user-friendly dialogues, yet Symfony, not even a little. The whole point of Symfony is you're writing code, you're editing things on disk. There is configuration, they are files on disk. Usually they're YAML files, but they can be other things. And there is no UI for them at all. That configuration is not read at runtime every time. Instead, it's compiled into a generated PHP class by uh, the development process <clears throat> and incorporated into the dependency injection container as parameters and properties. This is how Symfony's configuration works. You edit files on disk and check them into Git. Extensions uh, for Symfony, as we mentioned, are called bundles, essentially the same concept as modules. But even things like enabling one, you do by hacking code. You edit code for everything, even just turning on extensions. Those bundles can have their own configuration, and it's going to be files. In fact, the standard way to configure a bundle is look at its documentation, copy and paste these lines into your configuration file, into your YAML file, and edit to, to suit your taste. That, that is the way you configure bundles in Symfony. There are some bundles that provide some level of administrative interface, the most popular of which is the Sonata Admin Bundle. Uh, as I said, there are others. 
This is uh, from their online demo uh, of their dashboard. It looks kind of fancy. This is all a bundle. None of this is core Symphony. Uh, in this case, we've got you know, a list of the open comments and orders, list of customers. Note this message here. You can customize this dashboard by editing this YAML file. The current dashboard presents recent items, blah, 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 blah. If you want to make any changes to this admin whatsoever, you're editing a file. You're editing a template. You're editing a, a uh, configuration file. Everything you do is going to be crack open your code editor. <clears throat> and in, in this case, we're showing some really just basic roll-ups of uh, information here. So customers, number of pages, number of orders. These are just data objects. Um, we've got uh, their, the post list for post a specific type of content on their particular demo app. There is no generic concept of post in Symfony. Here's an edit screen for uh, cars, again, part of their demo app that you know, looks a little bit fancy, but this is all hard-coded in this bundle. There is no configuration here. There is no you know, fields. This is handcrafted interface. It's got a, a user interface, or a user um, admin interface, but it doesn't actually provide users. Symphony itself does not provide users out of the box. This is an add-on as well. So in Drupal, we're used to modules like organic groups that let you, you know, take existing content objects and through the UI enhance them and turn them into these clusters and allow users to be associated with them and so forth. We're used to modules like panels, which give you an incredible amount of power through the UI to define complex layout rules and pull out content from various parts of the system based on various business rules and you build these complex configured rule engines essentially for layout. Uh, no, there is no such thing in Symfony. It is not the way the system is designed to work. It's just culturally against the way Symfony works to do something like that. You want to change your layout? Go edit the template file. That's what it's there for. I mentioned even things like users are not baked into Symfony. You can roll your own uh, users if you want. It's not that hard. Or most people use uh, this bundle called FOSS User Bundle, which provides something vaguely on the same lines as Drupal's user support-ish. Uh, you know, gives you users, gives you a couple of admin screens that you can wire up. Um, but this is an add-on. Actually, the Symphony project I worked on last didn't use it because we didn't need users logging in, so we didn't have it. We just did something completely different for authentication. Incidentally, this FOSS here stands for Friends of Symphony. Symphony, it's kind of the closest equivalent Symphony has to Contrib. Uh, Symphony does not have a single canonical universe of add-ons the way Drupal.org is for Drupal. Uh, so there are a number of useful bundles that are under the Friends of Symphony banner. It's just a GitHub group, really, uh, of kind of high-level, well-maintained bundles. <clears throat> but for the most part, you find them randomly on packages or via Google. So when you're developing for Symphony, most of your dev tools are going to be from the command line. In Drupal, we have a lot of uh, tools in the UI. You switch your modes in the UI and so forth. And in Symfony, they're all command line tools. With one exception, which is the uh, dev toolbar they have in, uh, in, in Symfony, which is actually really, really, really cool. A lot of things are done with code scaffolding. Symfony itself ships with a uh, command line console tool, and a lot of commands built on that, many of which are code generation. So you say, I want to spin up a new entity, I want to spin up a new controller, new various other things. And it's actually really useful. You're going to use that a lot developing for Symfony and for Drupal 8 too. Uh, who's heard of Drupal console? Those of you who don't have your hands up, Google it. I think it's just drupalconsole.com. It's an excellent tool. Uh, it's built on the same Symfony console component and inspired by uh, the Symfony console. Uh, the develop lead developers for it are actually people who have done both Symfony and Drupal work. And it has a lot of scaffolding tools as well, which you're going to want in Drupal 8. We also have this dev prod, uh, you know, development versus production toggle concept in Symfony. In Drupal, we have these caches you can turn on and off, and CSS segregation you can turn on and off, and 
you know, these settings, you know, error reporting you can turn on and off and do all of these things independently of each other. And that means there really is no development mode and production mode. And we tried to get that into Drupal 8 and got pushed back because, oh, too, too coarse-grained, they're wrong. <clears throat> Not that I have strong opinions or anything. In Symfony, there is a development mode and a production mode. And never the screen shall meet. You have separate configuration files for them, and uh, that, that's what it comes down to. You don't have a, the ability to finagle little bits here and there as easily as you do in Drupal. Which, for the kind of stuff you're doing with Symfony, is just fine. <clears throat> that also means that when you're doing, uh, when you're switching to production mode, you need to force rebuild all of your caches. They do not self-clear, the way like in Drupal, if you have an empty cache for your container or for generated content or for CSS and JavaScript aggregation, Drupal will just rebuild the stuff on the fly as it needs to and you're good. In Symfony, the production mode, you have to rebuild it manually. It never happens automatically, which makes it a lot faster because it has to do less work and think about fewer things, but you do, you have to think about them instead. Architecturally, there's a lot of changes here. A lot of differences. First one, for all those Drupal 7 developers out there, we're used to functions, right? Not a single one. Symfony is a completely object-oriented system. There are no functions anywhere in the code base, to the best of my knowledge. Michelle, am I right on that? Okay, Michelle says I'm right. There are static methods in a couple of places, but not many. So it, it is a completely O system. If you are used to writing functions, uh, get over it if you're working with Symfony. Instead, most of your logic is going to be in services. Meaningful logic belongs in services. What is a service? A service is a stateless business logic object. It contains no data. It does not change once it's instantiated. It is wired into your dependency injection container, and that is your application. The vast majority of your business logic in Symfony belongs in stateless services. Everything else is glue code to connect those together. This is very different than Drupal 7, where we just had piles of functions lying around, and some of them collected data over time with statics, and some of them didn't, and there are, are oh my god, globals. Yeah. None of that in Symfony. Things are stateless services. You want to architect that way, and incidentally, if you're developing for Drupal 8, you do the same thing. This applies equally well to both systems. The configuration in Symfony is very unopinionated compared to what we're used to in Drupal. So I mentioned that there's configuration files, usually YAML, usually being the operative phrase there. Symfony actually supports PHP, XML, YAML, or annotations for nearly all configuration. It is possible to configure a Symfony application using any of these exclusively. Most sites will use a um, mix of YAML and annotations in practice, but that's not a hard rule. Please, please, please pick exactly one for your own project. Save yourself a lot of pain and, and anguish. <clears throat> that said, you may run into third-party bundles that you install where this one decided to use XML for its configuration and this one encourages annotations and this one uses PHP just to be different. Most of them, I think, at this point, use YAML and annotations, but you have to be familiar with all of them because different bundles may make different decisions. <clears throat> for your own work, I do recommend uh, YAML for as much as possible. If for no other reason, then that's what Drupal is using. Drupal is far less uh, forgiving in this regard. It's far more opinionated, and our configuration is all YAML, period. The Drupal way, in this case, is actually much stricter than the Symfony way. <clears throat> uh, that said, you're not going to get away from annotations. It, in practice, I don't think anyone does a completely annotation-free Symfony these days, so you're going to have to work with those one way or another. But really, what it comes down to, in either case, is we're doing some kind of metaprogramming. In Drupal, that metaprogramming is v done via the UI. In Symfony, it's being done via YAML. By metaprogramming, I mean <laughs> configuration that is pretty much code on its own that then drives the real code. That's essentially metaprogramming. You're doing the same kind of thing in both cases, but 
and Drupal is all via the interface and Symfony, your hand editing files. How about theming? The word theming doesn't actually exist as much in Symfony because you don't really have swappable themes the way you do in Drupal. There are some bundles to let have things called themes, but I've never worked with them. Um, I don't quite see their purpose compared to the way Drupal uses them. So templating, really, would be a better phrase here, uh, which brings up probably the biggest difference for front-end folks between uh, Drupal, any version, and Symfony, is that you, could, you only get one template, period. That's it. One. In Drupal, we have this you know, stacked Russian doll model where you, you render this part with this template and this part with this template and bring those together into this larger piece and render that with the template and bring that into a larger piece. Yeah, that's just not how Symfony works at all. It has a template, only one template. How does that work? It works through Twig's inheritance system. You don't have to use Twig with Symfony, but pretty much everyone does when they're doing HTML output. So how does this inheritance system work? Well. Let's look at the default out of the box demo index HTML template, uh, index HTML twig in Symfony. It's not quite fitting here. So we've got our markup and we've got some placeholders for it, but what's this block thing here? And style sheets are coming after the content. How does that work? That makes no sense at all. Some of you should recognize this at this point. The important thing here is this extends keyword. Extends in Twig is pretty much the same as extends in object-oriented code. Base HTML Twig looks like this. Ah, there's our template. There's our actual file. And we call out these blocks called title, style sheet. This title has some default values. Style sheet does not. Body, JavaScript. Block here has absolutely nothing to do with blocks as Drupal defines them. Not, not even the slightest. Blocks in this case are really closer to methods that back in this template, we are extending this template and then overriding the, block, the body block with this template fragment and overriding the style sheet block with this template fragment and not overriding the title. So we just get the default title in the uh, parent template. This is how you do more complex advanced theming for different parts of the page in Symfony. This capability does exist in Drupal because it's Twig, it's a standard feature of Twig. We're just not using it all that much in Drupal 8. That said, I encourage you to do so. Not for this. Not to try and turn the entire page into one template. Drupal will not like, will not like that. However, you can have custom versions of templates, say, have a, a node.html.twig for theming nodes, and then extend that for nodes of type article, nodes of type page, nodes of type event, and use extends that way. Core is not really doing that. You are at, welcome to do so in contrib themes. I highly encourage it. <clears throat> uh, but we do not go as far with it and cannot go as far with it as Symfony does, where you've got this one template per request. So let's talk about extending Symfony now. Now, Drupal developers, what is the first thing you learn about Drupal, about developing for Drupal? What's that? Clear, clear okay. When in doubt, clear cache. Okay, so what's the second thing you learn? <laughs> Don't hack core. That's right. If you're developing for Drupal, every time you hack core, God kills a kitten. Don't do that. Please think of the kittens. In Symfony, you're exactly supposed to do that. What? <laughs> How do you enable a new bundle in Symfony? Well, you have this app kernel.php class that is provided by the system out of the box. And oh, you want to add more bundles to your system? You edit this file and just add a new, you know, new whatever the bundles class name is. You can have bundles that only run in certain environments. So only like the web profiler and uh, this distribution bundle, those are only active in dev and test uh, modes instead of in prod mode. You want to do it differently? You want to structure this differently? Go ahead. You want to, uh, we're extending a, a base class here. You want to override something else from the base class? Go right ahead. 
You're encouraged to do so. This is weird. So let's look at the Symphony Project, how it's actually put together. Uh, again, this is the Symphony Standard Edition. So we've got this uh, basic project. This is the defaults install. I have done no customization at all to this. We have an app directory, bin, source, vendor, and web. And then our composer files put everything together. So bin is a couple of, it's like where the command line uh, tool lives. There's a few other things there. It's fairly uninteresting. Web, however, contains not all that much. App.php, appdev.php. These are your front controllers, the equivalent of index.php for Drupal. And these are actually hard-coded differently. This one is hard-coded to prod mode. This one is hard-coded to dev mode. So you want to look at your site in dev mode? You go to yoursite.com slash appdev.php slash blah, 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 blah. You, oh, you don't like it this way? You want to use an environment variable or something instead to switch it? Go ahead and hack these files. Really, I know people who do. One of my colleagues at Palantir does. It's fine. <clears throat> and there's nothing else here in PHP code. Drupal puts all of its PHP code and everything else in the doc root. Symfony puts almost nothing in the doc root. <clears throat> this, this is really the only PHP files you're going to have. You should probably strip out the config.php after you set it up initially. It's really just a, a setup wizard. Um, if a bundle ships with assets like CSS or JavaScript, those will get symlinked in here or generated files produced and dumped in here by uh, one of your compiled commands. <clears throat> Fender. Everyone who raised their hand for Composer should, should know this. This is where your Composer uh, downloaded packages go. Do not check this into your repository ever. Drupal is doing this wrong, yes. And do not edit anything in this directory, ever. But note, Symfony itself is in here. Symfony itself is a dependency of your project. Everything that is outside of here is boilerplate that is provided for you, please hack. Completely different than the way you approach uh, a Drupal site. The app directory is where <coughs> uh, your configuration lives. So these are those configuration files I was talking about. By default, YAML. So config.yaml is your shared configuration. And then we have a separate config file for every environment. So we can have different configuration for dev and test and prod. And this is where you put it to override that default configuration. You also have your routing information is here in a uh, YAML file. Separate routing for development, so you can have paths that only exist in dev mode. I'm not sure if you can do that to services offhand, to be perfectly honest, but you know, these are all your files. Edit them as needed. <clears throat> and those will all get compiled into a PHP class that lives in cache. Now, Drupal 8 is doing some of this, too, where it's actually generating PHP classes for Twig. So all Twig files get compiled into PHP, put on disk, and then that's what runs. Uh, the dependency injection container and all of your configuration gets compiled together into one gigantic multi-thousand line class, which is actually pretty fast, as long as it's not larger than your APC cache size. Yes, I tested this. <clears throat> um, and then resources. Resources are what Symfony calls assets. So templates, CSS files, JavaScript files, uh, all that kind of stuff are resources. And your top-level global uh, templates and CSS and so forth will go here. All of this is yours to edit, including the app kernel we saw before. You may not need to, but all of this is yours to edit. And then the source directory, this is your application. This is where your code for this application goes. This is the stuff that does get checked into uh, your Git repository. You can put any almost any structure you want here, to be perfectly honest. The convention is to have a single bundle called app bundle, which contains the code specific to this particular application. That's not a requirement. That's just the recommended convention. This is in contrast to Drupal, where we'll have a custom module, which is really no different than any other module. It's just where we dump stuff for a particular site, but you're encouraged to break stuff up into separate uh, modules and there's no, no one module is special over another. In Symfony, 
your site-specific stuff is just all in one big blob bundle here, and that's actually going to be a lot of code, whereas in Drupal, we try to keep it to a minimum. <coughs> uh, the discovery for that, all it looks for is a class. Actually, it doesn't even look for. We specify this class in the app kernel. We just name it, and it loads that class, and the autoloader finds it, and poof, we're done. And then it builds some stuff off of that uh, uh, namespace automatically. <clears throat> so that is your discovery, is you have a, a class with that name and you reference it from your, your, your own code. Uh, if you're building a reusable uh, bundle of some kind as part of a project, which you know, just like in, in Drupal, I'd say if you can do that, great, do so. You put that in a separate repository and pull that in via Composer. So one project may have three, four, five Composer repositories that go with it. Your actual project repository and then a couple of add-on bundles you've built, you may or may not be releasing, maybe you're sharing to other internal projects, whatever. Those are then considered third-party dependencies. The vast majority of the code in your project will live in the vendor directory as a third-party dependency. And that's a good thing. So given that, as you're going through your project, as you're you know, going through your development process, in Drupal, it usually looks like this. Push buttons, write some custom code, clear the cache, push some more buttons, clear the cache again, clear the cache another time just for good measure, <laughs> then check it in and, uh, and you're good. <coughs> and you know, depending on your version, you may have a feature export you have to do in Drupal 7 or a CMI export in Drupal 8, but uh, same idea. In Symfony, you write code while in dev mode. And for the most part, it just kind of works immediately. There are a few things you do need to manually clear in dev mode, which is annoying, but uh, for the most part, dev mode rebuilds its caches every single request. That's why it's dev mode, that's why it's much slower than prod mode. Once you have everything working the way you want, you clear your production cache uh, one time, which is actually several commands, because there's a couple of different caches you have to rebuild, and each of them have a separate command just to keep life interesting. Actually, it's for decoupling reasons, but still, it's kind of annoying. And then you really, really want to build a deployable snapshot. What's that? Well, do you really want to check out new code to your production server directly, and then run Composer update and wait for that to run, and then run cache clear and wait for that to get rebuilt, which takes a couple of seconds, and in all that time, a request comes in, it has no idea what to do because your code is all convoluted and out of sync and you no. Know. You really should do this for Drupal 2, but it's much more important in Symfony's case. So you can take a, you know, once you generate your production uh, version, you clear your production cache, you can take a, just a tarball snapshot of that entire project, deploy that, take that snapshot and push everything, including vendor, into a Git repository, and then that just check out in production that one snapshot. A couple of ways of doing this, that's a whole other session. Um, but look, look for production artifacts is the way you want to use Symfony. You can do that with Drupal 2. Uh, in Drupal 8, I do recommend it, but it's just not something we're used to doing in the Drupal world. Drupal 8 and Symfony are using the same underlying kernel. So who's seen this picture before it's at some point or some variant of it? About half the room? OK. So, the basic core pipeline of most Symfony-based applications, which includes Symfony, Drupal 8, Silex, a whole bunch of others, is we have this HTTP kernel class. So a request comes into the system, a request event fires, Drupal people think hook request alter, essentially. Then there's a controller event, think hook, uh, hook request post routing alter, basically. Then a controller, aka page callback, fires and does whatever that request is gonna do and it can return a response or not a response. If it returns not a response, a view event fires and then any number of view listeners is able to take a look at that controller result and say, do I know how to turn this into an actual response object? Yes, okay, I'll do it, we're done. Or no, I'll let the next one handle it. Either way, we end up with a response object, there's a response event, hook response alter, that gets sent uh, back to the, uh, the browser, then there's a terminate event to do some end cleanup, and we're done. 
Both Symfony 2 and Drupal 8 use this pipeline. They use the exact same code for it. However, they use it very differently. In Drupal, you always are using the view event. You may not be writing any code for it yourself. In fact, you usually will not be. But the view event is always used. On 98% like of requests, the view event is going to fire and do whatever it's going to do. Symfony, you can, but the conventions in Symfony actually discourage leveraging that. I think this is kind of weird, personally. It's done for performance reasons, but I think it's architecturally a weaker way of doing it because it doesn't separate concerns as well. Uh, I, I'm a fan of the action domain responder model, and that's what Drupal is using here. So let's look at an example of Symfony controller. This is, again, straight out of the uh, demo bundle that comes with uh, the Symfony full stack. <clears throat> so uh, first thing to note, in Drupal, our controllers, our methods, named whatever you feel like. In Symfony, there's some black magic involved. I don't fully comprehend when this is the case, but in almost all cases, the controller method ends in action. This is roughly intended for uh, grouping uh, methods in a class, <clears throat> uh, but that's just the way Symfony is going to work. And then we're returning the results of calling this render with a template name and this array of parameters. So ignore the actual information here for the time being. That's not relevant. Essentially, what we're doing here is like calling the theme function in Drupal 7, or Drupal render, really, and returning the result of that. In Symfony, this is encouraged. This is the recommended way of doing things. In Drupal, uh-uh. You return a render array. You do not call render yourself. It's just not a thing. Don't do it. In Symfony, you do it. Maybe, maybe not. You can, in fact, also return a, an array from here and use another annotation to say, by the way, the template you should use for this controller is this other template, and then that array will get passed to that template by the view listener. Um, again, I like that approach myself, but it does have a performance overhead. That's why it's discouraged. <clears throat> uh, and also note, in this case, we're using an annotation for the route too. Could be in YAML, could be an annotation. It, your project could go either way. There's long arguments about which way is better or more sustainable. Please just be consistent. <clears throat> speaking of paths and speaking of routing, though, in Drupal 8, if you want to register a route, you're going to generally use a routing.yaml file in a module. And then by turning on the module, all of those routes will automatically get registered in the system. If it's a dynamic route of some kind, it's based on user configuration, there's an event that fires, think like hook menu alter type thing, um, where you can create additional routes that way. All of those paths in those routes are rooted at this, your site route, always. There's no magic nesting happening. And all of those paths are very fixed uh, patterns. Node slash ID, user slash ID, term slash ID, that's how all of the routes work. And then we layer aliases on top of them to make it look pretty for users and search engines. In Symfony, well, you can have a routing file, which could be YAML or XML or PHP. Or, as we saw on the last slide, they could be annotations on a controller. They could be any, num any of these. I'm not actually sure if there is a dynamic me mechanism. There prob I, from what I've seen, actually, there's a couple, depending on which module you're building off of. And then it does use path nesting. So those routing files are not registered automatically. Just loading the, uh, a bundle doesn't register its routes. You have to go to the routing file up in app and explicitly say, by the way, include this other, uh, route, this other bundle's routing.yaml file and rooted at this path prefix. So if you have routes that are being provided by, say, FOSS user bundle, you can say, all of those routes, I want to start with a slash user path. And then if everything in, that, in the FOSS user bundle's routing file are off of that path. Or on another side, to say, oh, I want them all rooted at slash admin, or slash Bob, or slash go away, this is mine, whatever. And then instead of aliasing, uh, the convention is to use slugs. Slugs, I have no idea where this thing comes from, to, to be perfectly honest, but slugs are short uh, string identifiers for a data object. I need to go a little bit faster here. For, uh, for a data object. 
the rough equivalent would be uh, if you've done Drupal sites where you have a text field, a hidden uh, text field that is put a path fragment here, and then you use path auto to say the, the path alias is always content slash that, uh, that field. That's essentially what you do. Personally, I like the Drupal way better, but this is how Symfony works. Right. Storing data. In Drupal, we have a lot of it. In Drupal 8, we've got entities, the Venerable Entity API. We've got the new State API. We have our Configuration API for information you want to be deployable. We have the Key Value API. In Symfony, you get Doctrine. Just Doctrine. Or something else if you feel like dropping it in, but Doctrine is what most people use. Doctrine is a completely standalone PHP project from Symfony. It has its own release schedule, its own staff, a lot of people who are part of both Symfony and Doctrine, but it is a uh, standalone ORM, Object Relational Mapper, and it really only supports simple objects. We'll see this, I'm gonna repeat this a lot. It does not have the capabilities that Entity API has. <clears throat> Pretty much, you get a one-to-one -one mapping from database fields to properties on the object. And that's as much as you get in terms of your data capability. And if you want to do something with Mongo, there's a separate add-on for that called the ob uh, Object Document Mapper, uh, Doctrine uh, ODM, or yeah, Doctrine ODM, um, that in theory works for any document system, but in practice, Mongo is the only one that works. <clears throat> so let's compare these. In Drupal, our entities are configuration-driven. You have what Drupal calls bundles, like node types, which are configurations, user configurations, of rich fields. All fields that you configure are inherently multi-value. Even if you only have a single value in them, you configure them to pretend to be single value. At a code level, they are all multi-value, period. And these are rich data types we're talking about. So it's not just string and int, but email field, uh, telephone number, street address, image, uh, relationship field, <clears throat> like ent entity reference. That's the level that Drupal works at. Doctrine is much more primitive. Everything is a custom class. All your entity types are custom classes you define. And they only have simple properties on them, things that can map pretty straightforward to a, uh, an SQL field. None of them are multi-value. You can declare a field as being an array, in which case it gets stored as a serialized blob in the database. Exactly. Uh, so these, these are really simple data types only. It's much more rudimentary. Um, and if, if you want to have something that's a multi-value multi -value searchable field, uh, the way to do that is make another entity for that and you reference it uh, multiple times. It's, it, coming from Drupal, this was actually really painful for me to work with because it is so primitive compared to what I was used to in terms of how expressive it was. Uh, gotcha's there. As I said, it's just compared, coming from Drupal, it's very primitive. It does a lot. It, it does handle a lot of stuff for you. You basically never touch an SQL schema yourself. But if you're coming from Drupal entities, it is going to feel very, very primitive. The SQL, uh, the, the default SQL version and the MongoDB version have very different APIs. I don't just mean SQL and Mongo are different. They are. But the capabilities are different. The way you model the data is different. There are just modeling capabilities that are only there in the ODM version, the Mongo version. And a lot of like the event names are different. The command lines tools for clearing the cache are different. A lot of things are needlessly different between the SQL and Mongo versions. That, that was something that really annoyed me uh, the first time I used Mongo with it. Uh, there are events with Doctrine, equivalent to like hook node pre-save, same basic idea. Uh, but they are different event listeners than the Symfony event listeners because Doctrine is a separate project and has its own event system. It makes sense that it's that way. It's still annoying. You still need to be aware of it. I actually know some people who will write bridge code to mutate Doctrine events into Symfony events so that they don't have to deal with that difference. Uh, and it's file handling. File handling on the web is a huge pain, period. Drupal... Um, actually does pretty good in this regard compared to a lot of systems. Doctrines is uh, fairly, even more primitive. Okay, that said, there are still similarities. This is actually part of the point. This is one of the reasons why Drupal 8 was refactored as heavily as it was, because there are similarities between Symfony and other modern systems and Drupal 8 now. 
Biggest one, services. We saw the slide before. Your meaningful logic belongs in services. They are stateless. This is where your business logic goes. Loosely coupled or fully decoupled classes that you instantiate through, your service, uh, through the dependency injection container. This is true of Symfony. This is true of Drupal 8. This is true of Laravel. This is true of Zen Framework. Most modern PHP frameworks work this way. And this is why Symfony moved to this, why Drupal moved to this model. Event listeners in, you know, Drupal has event listeners in it, uh, mostly around the kernel. Those should be glue code. In both uh, Symfony and in Drupal, your event listeners should just be glue code that hands <coughs> off to a service. Incidentally, your hooks should be the same way. Don't put lots and lots of business logic into hooks in Drupal. Put that in a service, and then the hook just bridges out to it. <clears throat> that underlying kernel, it is the same kernel. It is the exact same code. We are staying in sync. We're just pulling in Symfony as a vendor for Drupal. So if there's something that you would do in a, a uh, request event to tweak the, event, uh, the request somehow, it's going to be the exact same code both ways. Hooks and listeners are essentially the same idea. Uh, listeners are a bit more heavyweight, a bit more elegant, more testable. Hooks are a bit lighter weight. We have a lot more hooks in Drupal uh, than Symfony has listeners, in part because of tagged services. This is a, a tool of the Symfony dependency injection container that both Symfony and Drupal 8 use, where instead of having an event, which is actually fairly heavy, you can set up services to relate to each other. So all services with this tag on it that I've configured get used this way, get thrown into this other service that can iterate through them. So uh, that dichotomy exists in both Symfony and in Drupal 8. And of course, Twig. Give or take the template inheritance. Otherwise, it's the same Twig. Almost all the same syntax, almost all the same capabilities, almost all the same tools, uh, the same auto-escaping logic, the same general awesomeness. Go talk to Morton. Uh, go to one of his sessions later today or tomorrow. I'm not quite sure when his session is, if you want to know more about why Twig is awesome. Um, and as, as I said, you can use template inheritance yourself for your own templates in Drupal 8, which I do encourage. Uh, in Symfony, you'll be using it for everything. And with that said, go forth and make something musical. Thank you. <laughs> We've got about uh, nine, ten minutes left, so if you want questions, there's a microphone right over there, or I can repeat stuff if you can't get to the microphone. I answered everyone's questions completely. That's amazing. Uh-oh. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, uh, sort of sort out one mystery that you talked about, whether that, you know, the action postfix on the mm -hmm. action names. So that basically is part of, um, so you, there are actually two ways how to define a controller or bring it into the system. Mm -hmm. And one is uh, basically by a naming convention, and that's the one that you showed. Um, and there you have to have your, your actions have to be postfixed with the word action. And the second one is defining controllers as services. And there, you basically uh, can just use whatever method names you want. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the difference there. OK. So, that, so for those who don't know, I'm Lucas Smith of Symfony. Um, Drupal using Symfony is also his fault. So you can blame him. <laughs> so thank you for that. Other questions? Other clarifications? I think we've got someone coming up here. Michelle, do you want to correct me on anything? <laughs> Hi, Larry. Uh, the, the container, the dependency injection container, that PHP file that you mentioned about the mm -hmm. deployment uh, version, like a tar file, is there any best practice around uh, a multi-node in a production environment, like how to either keep them centralized in one location or in a different node, and if something goes wrong, how to bring the, you know, mm -hmm. like regenerate them in production yeah. if we have to? Yeah, so how, how to deal with all the compiled code in a, a multi-head environment. That's something that's actually very different between Drupal and Symfony. In Symfony, the answer is you're going to generate it uh, on your dev box once with a command line tool and then take that whole snapshot and push that to all of your web heads at once. And it will never change once it's on those web heads unless you specifically redeploy to your web heads. 
in Drupal. Um, this is actually something we just fixed like in the last two weeks uh, where we didn't know how to do that. Uh, what we actually switched to, I believe, I could be wrong on this, is uh, the compiled container and compiled twig now actually stored in an index in the database rather than on disk. So that's another big difference between the way Symfony and Drupal are using um, the generated code. So I, I haven't actually looked at all the, all the details on the Drupal side there, um, and they, they may change again for all I know, but uh, in, in Symfony's case, you do not regenerate that code on your webhead. You regenerate it beforehand and then push that generated code to all of your webheads at once, and then it's never gonna change on there. Same with your CSS and JavaScript. If you're doing any uh, aggregation or, or compression with those, you're doing all of that offline and then pushing that out to your production servers. Yeah. You, um, you mentioned Drupal 8 ships with Symfony. So what happens when you find a bug in Symfony? Um, because you know it ships with core. Do you file a patch for core, for Symfony? What happens when that patch gets committed to Symfony? Does that warrant a new Drupal core release? So how does that work? So excellent question. The so Drupal 8 does have the Symfony components we're using checked in to our repository. This is mainly because we screwed up our composer usage and haven't fixed it yet. Hopefully we'll fix that soon. If we, you know, that said, it's still untouchable code. If you find a bug in Drupal that turns out to be in a Symfony component, that gets fixed upstream in Symfony. What I would recommend, file a bug with Drupal. Actually, no, excuse me. First, file a bug with Symfony, uh, preferably with a pull request, if you can. And then file a bug in Drupal saying, by the way, here's this bug, here's the, the link to the Symfony bug for it, and so we can track it that way, and then we'll close our bug when Symfony uh, fixes theirs. And we will be keeping up to date on uh, Symfony bug fixes uh, throughout Drupal's release. So I'm not sure the exact schedule for it, but expect when we have our bug fix releases monthly, uh, we'll probably be updating to the latest Symfony patch versions at, uh, at that point. And I believe the plan is to also go with Symfony miners when Drupal miners uh, ship. So 8 point, Drupal 8.1 will update to whatever the latest Symphony release is as of around then. So we'll get all of those bug fixes as well. Uh, hi Larry, imagine this uh, scenario. Drupal 8 uh, has been fully released in a stable version. You're not here in uh, DrupalCon and uh, a client come and wants to make a project that is quite uh, complicated. It's not a WordPress project and which technology you will go for. You are completely free to, to, to choose a technology, which one will, you will f choose between Drupal 8 and Symfony. Which are, it's really going to depend on the project. The deciding factor for me is Drupal does an awful lot for you. There are certain things that if done with Drupal will take you a tenth as long as with Symfony. But then they're done in a Drupal way. Does doing it the Drupal way actually fit your use case? If yes, great, do it. Use Drupal. That's why it's there. If, on the other hand, you're going to find yourself fighting against Drupal the whole way, and you know, the assumptions Drupal makes around its UI, the assumptions it makes around uh, the way content is structured, if those assumptions are wrong in your case, then write your own assumptions with Symfony. Um, here's a, a good example. We had a project... Uh, about a year and a half ago, I think, where a client came to us and they wanted to build what they said was a CMS, but the data they were storing, they had a couple million records, and the data they were storing really did not fit well into a node structure. Uh, I mean, uh, nodes are a very specific structure with fields that are rich fields, and those are multi-value, and you don't have nested fields inside fields. You can kind of sort of do stuff like that with field collections or uh, multi-field and other modules like that, but it, it gets unwieldy very, very fast. So the data didn't really fit it, and then they wanted a user interface that really didn't fit Drupal's view page and edit page model. Um, they specifically wanted Drupal, and so we ended up doing it in Drupal. In hindsight, that project should have been done in Symfony because we, it would have let us just skip trying to fight Drupal's interface assumptions. Uh, we ended up building some custom fields to store data fragments as XML strings 
in a text field that we could then deserialize on load. And it, it's what we had to do to put it into Drupal, but that's a place where the more freeform nature of doctrine would actually have been a better fit. Uh, so it, it, really what it comes down to, Drupal makes more assumptions. If those assumptions are correct for you, great. Use Drupal, save yourself loads of time. And if those assumptions are wrong and you're gonna spend your, your time fighting Drupal, then skip the assumptions, just build it yourself with Symfony. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. For both this session and, and any others you go to, please do fill out evaluations online. It's very helpful for speakers. It's helpful for the conference. Um, we're Drupal, so we don't use joined in, whatever. But do, do go to the, Drupal, the uh, DrupalCon website and fill out evaluations for sessions there, for all of the sessions you go to. Thank you.